الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> It's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our brother Hamza Yusuf whom we all know and love and we are so fortunate to have him here with us in Louisville again. Um, a couple of Ramadans ago he called me early in the morning. He was in tears because one of his children had come from school and was learning things that were really quite incorrect and wrong. And so we set about on a project together. We're working together, Zaytuna and Fans Vitae, to bring out the entire Ihya al from a recent extraordinary critical edition and at the same time do a version, we are working on a version for 12-year-olds and 5-year-olds with illustrations. And it's the most amazing project and there have been people here in the room like Ambreen Paracha who have already helped us with this and we're working very hard to make this possible. And so that's why um, Hamsa tonight will speak about the critical importance of Al-Ghazali in our times. Welcome. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم I was just wondering who is that your computer? Because was your screensaver a Rastafarian flag? <laughs> okay. That's interesting. So, because I thought I saw a Rastafarian flag between those images, and I, so I'll begin with a quote by Bob Marley, uh, which relates to Imam Al Ghazali. Uh, Bob Marley said, uh, he said, uh, free yourselves, free your minds from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. And have no fear of atomic energy, for they cannot stop the time. How long will we stand aside? How long will they kill our prophets as we stand aside and look? But some say that's all a part of it. We have to fulfill the book. So I thought I'd give you a little Bob Marley quote there. <laughs> the, uh, the picture that was chosen for Imam al-Ghazali was, uh, it really troubled me <laughs> because I think Imam al-Ghazali, if he saw it, the first thing he would do is take a sledgehammer and, and literally tear it down because Imam al-Ghazali was a great iconoclast. And, and unlike the, those who destroyed the idols that are worshipped made of stone and wood and other things, he was interested in destroying the idols that our minds generate. He was interested in destroying the idols of the ego. And he actually considered the greatest idol to be the idol of the self. And so this is, this is his starting point, really, in letting us recognize that shirk, this concept that is so profound and constant in the Quran, this idea of associating with God, he really felt that the, the great association with God was the idea that the self had some kind of independent existence. And, and that was the idol that he was engaged in dismantling and deconstructing. And in that way, he will continue to be relevant for, for all time because he, he set about really to articulate as best he could the way that that could be done. And, that, and that's his great opus, the Ihya Ulum Adin. So I, what I'd like to do is look at three aspects of Imam al-Ghazali and conclude with why he remains relevant for us today. The first aspect of his life is that he was born in an incredible time and place to be born for somebody of his genius. Because there, there, there have been probably countless geniuses that were born and still are in places where their genius is never nurtured or enhanced. And I've met some really brilliant, uh, illiterate people that 
had they had the opportunity to go to school and to learn and, and to cultivate their minds. In fact, I was once in, uh, in Arabia, I was in Jeddah, and there was this really unusual Eritrean, she was uh, an Ethiopian girl, so we're back to Rastafarians. She was an Ethiopian girl, and, and she was working as a maid in this house, and she was like a wild thoroughbred. They had such a hard time with this girl, and, and because she was just constantly challenging them and questioning things, and finally she actually lost her job. Uh, because I would ask about her when I would go back, how was she doing? But she lost her job because they couldn't handle her. And what was very clear to me was that she was she felt so wronged by just being in this economic hardship of having to leave her country to go to a foreign country and to be treated um, in in a condition that really wasn't uh, that humane. And so she was constantly rebelling against this. There are many, many stories like that around the globe. She, uh, Imam al-Ghazali, however, happened to be born, first of all, into an extremely pious family. His father loved scholars. His father was not a scholar, but he loved scholars, and he spent his time serving scholars. And his one desire was that his children would become scholars. And he died early and left Imam al-Ghazani and his brother Ahmed orphans. But before he died, he left a little bit of money and put him in the care of a very pious man and told him to raise them in the best manner so that they would be pious people. And what happens is Imam al-Ghazali, both he and his brother were actually very, very intelligent and displayed uh, their, their brilliance very early on in the madrasa, and they learned what could be learned in Tus at the time. As he entered into his early uh, youth where he would be ready to move to the next level, he was sent to a place, he's born literally in, in he's born at the head of the sixth century uh, Islamic era, and he, he goes to this school, and it just so happens that probably the most brilliant scholar in the Muslim world was there at the time. And we underestimate the impact that this has because, just to give you an example, there, there, the, uh, the ping pong champion of Great Britain uh, wrote a book um, called Ping. And in that book, um, he says he's going to answer the question of why he became the ping pong champion of Great Britain. A lot of people don't know that after China, Great Britain is the second most important ping pong country in the world. Uh, Br British people don't really do too many outdoor sports, so they're really good at ping pong. But this man said, I would like to argue that I was just this really talented, genius ping pong player. But that would be a lie. And so I'm going to tell you why I really am the great ping pong champion of Great Britain. It's because when I was eight years old, my father brought, bought, for some reason, uh, a proper tournament size ping pong table of very good quality and put it in the garage. And I happened to have a 10-year-old brother who loved to play ping pong. And so we played ping pong all day long. And so what he says is, he was sent to a school because his house was one house away in the zoning, and he happened to go to the school with the best ping pong instructor in Great Britain. And because he had mastered this thing as a child, he was prepared to have this great teacher. And he ended up being apprenticed, taking, uh, uh, this teacher took him as an apprentice, and he literally learned all of these things that he would not have learned in another place. And so we forget, this is the element of Qadr. And we forget about this, that, that we would like to take credit for a lot of what we do and who we are. But so much of it involves other things that have nothing to do with us. It's pure circumstance. One of the things uh, Robert Frost said in a beautiful poem, uh, if you should rise from somewhere up to nowhere, from being somebody up to being some, from being nobody up to being somebody, be sure to repeat to yourself, you owe it to an arbitrary God whose mercy to you rather than to others won't bear too critical examination. Stay unassuming. 
if for lack of license to wear the uniform of who you are. You should be tempted to make up for it in a subordinating look or tone. Beware of coming too much to the surface and using for apparel what was meant to be the curtain of the inmost soul. Imam al-Ghazali was a nobody who became a somebody. He was from nowhere and became from somewhere. But he forgot to stay unassuming. So he had the best teacher in the Muslim world, Imam al jawaini And he was his best student. In fact, Imam al jawaini said about him, he's an ocean that you can drown in, which some people say was a, 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 a kind of double-edged compliment. Imam al ghazali at a very early age, mastered all of the sciences at that time. And, and that was a place where they were learning all of these intellectual tools. He mastered logic at a er very early age. And one of his first books was a book on logic. He mastered uh, grammar. He mastered rhetoric. He was a, uh, a rhetorician in both Persian and in Arabic. Uh, he wrote, his poetry is not that extensive, but he was an excellent poet. He's one of the finest literary stylists in the Arabic language, and this is something notable because many of the scholars uh, who write in Tafsir, while they write in good, uh, in good Arabic, they're not known for their literary style, whereas he constantly uses extraordinary metaphors, uh, stunning uh, turns of, of phrases and, and tropes and figures, and so he's a delight to read simply as a literary, uh, a piece of literature. But what was happening to Imam al-Ghazali is he was learning very quickly that to be clever and brilliant was something that impressed other people. And in that culture, which took education very seriously, it was a way of advancing yourself. And he became very obsessed with this. He could pretty much win, and, and he did. He, he won every argument he ever got into. And he became, according to his own statement, he became intolerable as a, as a person. And at a certain point, he latches on to the coterie of the, the, one of the rulers at that time, a minister. After finishing with Imam al jawaini he comes to him and enters into his court and becomes one of the court scholars. And this was a way of career advancement, um, what we would today call scholars for dollars. So he was in this environment, and this uh, minister, who Nizam al-Mulk, is one of the most extraordinary characters in, in uh, Islamic political history. He, he himself was a scholar of his own weight. But he recognized that al-Ghazali's genius could be used to forward his, he had an agenda, and that agenda was to establish a certain type of Sunni normative Islam, a Sunni orthodoxy, because he was living at a time where you had uh, Ismaili botanists, these were esoterists who wanted to uh, esotericize Islam to where the outward meanings were really not important, but it was the inner message of the, of the tradition. And so he goes then, and begins to write polemical writings against the botanists and against others. And at the same time, he's writing books in a, 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 a really large uh, spectrum of interest. He had a vast encyclopedic mind and was capable of grasping very, very difficult uh, concepts. So he goes, and in the, eight, in the, uh, uh, the 590s, Islamic era, he, in a, in a period of about four years, he has this immense output. He writes a, a critique. First, he writes a book on what are called the aims and purposes of the philosophers, Maqasid al falasifa And then he refutes those aims and purposes in another book, which is called Tahafat al falasifa which 100 years later leads to the refutation of Averroes or Ibn Rushd called Tahafat al tahafut which is the incoherence of the incoherence. Uh, because he called it the incoherence of the philosophers, also the deconstruction of the philosophers. So at this time, he's, he's got this incredible output. He's made in his 30s, he, he becomes the head of the Nilamiya, uh, a head professor at the Nilamiya in Baghdad. And this would be like being appointed 
uh, to the head of Harvard, one of the chairs of Harvard at a very early age. And in the Muslim world, this was uh, really unprecedented. So his classes would bring literally thousands of people. These were done in very large masjid in Baghdad. And not just students could come, but other people a time of incredible intellectual activity. So all these people are coming, and Imam al-Ghazali gives dazzling speeches, he gives incredible uh, classes, very eloquent, all, everything at his hands, literally, all the tools of knowledge. He, he pretty much knows everything there is to know, and this was said uh, in, in the pre-modern world, this was something that was quite possible. You could literally master what was known at the time. I mean, we forget that the Encyclopedia Britannica of the, the first edition, I think it's in, in uh, 1734, has three volumes. It was, it was quite small because there, the, 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 this explosion of information that occurs uh, in the 19th and 20th century, prior to that, somebody like Goethe could literally be a master of what was capable of mastering in terms of outward sciences during his life. This is what Imam al-Ghazali did. But he himself was struggling. He, he was profoundly troubled by his own state. And he, he wrote uh, his autobiography, Munqid Min al which is a, the savior from error. And what he does is he categorizes four types of knowledge. He argues that there is the knowledge of the philosophers, which is a rational knowledge, the knowledge of the theologians, which is a knowledge with that has rational component and a component of revelation, and then the knowledge of the esotericist. And he would, philosophers at that time would also be what we would call today scientists, because they understood that natural philosophy was actually a branch of philosophy. So they considered scientists to be natural philosophers. So he, he would mean by today, he would categorize the scientists under that category. People like Dawkins and and, and, and those who expound a materialistic view of the world, the tabayun, the, 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 who were called the naturalists or the materialists, or dahriyun is another term that was used. So what he does is he, he basically, he, he, he writes this incredibly revealing autobiography about his own crisis, and he tells us what happens to him. And basically what happens is he goes to the to the masjid to give his lecture, and there's all the students, and he is incapable of speaking. He can't speak. And he said that for the, the, the year prior to that, he had wavered whether to set out on this path or not to, and what he meant by it was the path of realization, because the, the, third, the third category of knowledge that he argues were called the esotericists, they were people that claimed that there were certain people that had special knowledges that were inaccessible to other people. And we just had to follow these people. And then finally he said the last claim was to the people of Tasawwuf, who argued that knowledge was the knowledge of experience, of taste, and that real faith came from experience and not from a set of, of logical propositions that you memorized in a, in a textbook. And so he, 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 he studied each of the previous ones, all, all three, and he mastered each of them. And what's interesting about Al-Ghazali is he, he did not suffer fools lightly, but the reason for that is because he had really taken all of these arguments to their logical conclusions. And he argued that sectarianism is based on people not taking their arguments to their logical conclusions. He felt that the sectarian mind was a superficial mind because they were trapped in an inability to exhaust their own thought and realize that their own thought, if they exhausted it, was actually a dead end. And because he went to the end of each of these positions and realized that they were dead ends. And in that way, there's a postmodern element to Ghazali, which is very interesting. What he's arguing is these narratives, these grand narratives that these, these, uh, these groups erect and then really become idols that they put up can actually be dismantled if you, if you use the right tools to dismantle them. And this is what he does. With each group, he dismantles their arguments. The only group that he said that he could not dismantle 
was these people of Tasawwuf because what he said was their argument was not a rational argument. And he had all the rational tools to fight these other groups. Their argument was an argument of experimental psychology. What he was saying was that they were, what they were arguing is that this is a science of the self that can dismantle the self and allow the self to perceive the reality of the self. And he, he argues that it is a science because they argue that it can be replicated. And this is the essence of science, that you can replicate an experiment. If you cannot replicate, to use Popper's terms, it's non-falsifiable. Uh, Popper would say religion is non-falsifiable, which is the problem with it. Only something that's falsifiable, that we can actually test it empirically, that we can actually establish it as a science. What Al-Ghazali says is what these men and women have argued historically is that if you do these things with these preconditions, you will have the same journey as everybody else that has taken this journey. And it will lead to the same certainty that gave these previous peoples. Here's the map. He argues that you need a guide, although he himself, it's arguable that he did not take a guide. But he argues that you need a guide. He gives you the map. He tells you what you need for the journey. And then he argues that you have to set out on the journey. He can't help you after that. But what he says, and the reason why he's called the proof of Islam, is what he says is, I took this journey, and the destination is real. This is not a fantasy place. This is not what what. You know, Wat Wat in the stories of Sinbad, this magical place somewhere in the east. This is not Wat Wat. This is a real place, a place of presence, of experience, of ecstasy. Because the word wajada in Arabic, which means to find, also means to enter into an ecstatic state. And this is what he's arguing. So when he has his crises, he decides to, to set out. Now, he has, prior to this, written some of the most important books in the history of Islam. People know him for the Ihya. The reality of it is his, his single most important book, historically, has been the Mustasfa, which is in Usul. And Eric Ornsby, I think, rightly argues in his, autobiog in his biography of Ghazali that Ghazali was essentially an Usuli scholar. This, this is his great opus, is the Mustasfa. And when I asked Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, one of the greatest Usuli scholars living, if he would, this is the question that I always pose to scholars. I asked him, if you were on a desert island, you could only take one book with you, other than the Quran and the Hadith, which would it be? And Sheikh Abdullah told me, Al-Mustasfa by Imam al-Ghazali, which is Usuli text. And, and he adds things to our Usuli tradition that Imam al juwaini who was his teacher, began to develop, but Ghazali himself took it to the next level. And all of Usul after Ghazali is dependent on Ghazali. This is a fact of our Usuli tradition. So we forget that he was a great Usuli scholar. He was a great moral ethicist. He wrote Mizan al-Amal is one of his uh, books on moral ethics. He, he, he wrote uh, that the book he never left home without, although he memorized it, he still carried it in a physical book, was Raghab al-Isbahani. He'd put it to memory. And this was something that he'd learned on a journey after he'd come back studying. He was on his way back home. And he had all of his books uh, and on, on a donkey. And the brigand who robbed this caravan robbed, uh, took his books, and he begged him to leave his books. And he said, why should I leave them? He said, that's all my knowledge. I spent three years gathering this knowledge. So please don't deprive me of it. And he said that the brigand laughed. And he said, what kind of knowledge is it that a brigand can steal it from you? And is this really knowledge? And Ghazali says in his book that I know that it was God that made him speak so that I would learn a lesson. And from that day forward, he never learned anything except he put it to memory. 
So he literally memorized all of his texts that he studied and taught. And one of them was Raghav Dispahani's book on ethics, which is one of the most brilliant, in my estimation, books ever written in, in moral philosophy. Uh, it's called Dhari'a ila Makarim al-Shari'a. It's actually translated into English. Uh, and it was published by Istak. He, he was heavily indebted to Raghav Dispahani in ethics, but he wrote uh, an Aristotelian virtue ethics, what we call virtue ethics today, um, but added to it a spiritual component that's lacking clearly in the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. Uh, very similar to what Aquinas did, and Aquinas we know not only read Ghazali in Latin, but he also attributes uh, that source uh, in his bibliography. So uh, Aquinas does mention Ghazali, Averroes, uh, and uh, Ibn Sina, who was called Avicenna. So Imam al-Ghazali wrote all of these extraordinary books, and then he sets out on this journey. He realizes he has to leave, because these doctors come, and they look at him, they take his pulse, they look at his urine, they do all the things that doctors at that time did, and they said that he was suffering from melancholia. And it's very common in the humoral theory which was a theory very dominant in the Muslim world as well as the Greco-Roman world and is still used in, in uh, Catholicism. They still actually uh, believe in the humoral theory of temperaments. But the argument, most scholars are choleric by nature. Uh, in fact, it's the choleric uh, temperament that enables a scholar to study as much. But if a scholar studies too much, and is too prodigious in his output, he falls into melancholia, which is the Saudawi personality. So he goes from the Safrawi to the Saudawi. So what they argued was that he has exhausted himself. He has, there's so much output that he has exhausted himself. What Al-Ghazali realized, and this is part of his genius, was the reason he had exhausted himself is because he was relying on himself for all that he had done prior to that that his entire corpus to that point was based on his reliance on his self. It was all from his self, that he was just putting out from his self. And that's why his self was exhausted, because it couldn't do anymore. And at that point, he couldn't talk. And so the very thing that had elevated him and made him the most extraordinary scholar in the Muslim world had also ended up ending his career. It was the tongue, and we forget the power of the tongue. The pen is mighty, but the tongue is mightier. Because of his tongue and his eloquence and his brilliance and his abilities, he was able to rise from a cobbler's son, a weaver's son, to the highest academic position in the Muslim world, and yet he'd realize not only was he a complete phony, but he could no longer play this game with himself anymore. And he said, it was God that did this to me. And he thanked God for that gift. And then he decides to set out on this journey. And for the next 12 years, he takes a journey. And this journey will take him all over that part of the Muslim world at the time. He spends two years sweeping the mosque in Damascus. Now, you can imagine this is, this is like somebody whose stature is so great intellectually. In our culture, this would be like the head of Harvard become a, becoming a janitor in the National Cathedral and telling nobody to abase himself. And then he goes to Jerusalem, he writes, and he's writing during this time, but he's, he said practice was always difficult for him. It was always easier to open a book than to practice. And what he does during this time is what he calls riyava, which is the spiritual disciplining of the soul. And that's why he writes considerably about riyava. Towards the end of this period, he writes his opus, uh, Magnus, which is the Ihya Ulum Adin. He gives it the title, reviving or the revivication of the sciences in, in the, in the pre-modern sense of that word, not like we use it today, but in, in, in the, the Latin meaning of it, of knowledge, scientia, the, the sciences of the religion. And he begins with a book called Kitab al-Ilm. This is the book of knowledge. And what he argues in there is that 
the people that are known as the mutarasimun, he calls them formalists, the people that stop at the letter of the word, that they spend their lives discussing words. He's, he, he argues that these people have destroyed Islam. And he really challenges them. If, if you read the Ihya, what you will find is that it's constantly, for scholars, it's one of the hardest books to read because he is constantly calling you a hypocrite. And, and, and the reason he's capable of doing that is because he was the best of the best. And, and he knows the heart of the scholar. He knows the place of stature in the scholar's world, of, of the applause and the love of bravo. He knows exactly what that means, the accolades that one gets for their cleverness, for their production, for their brilliance. He was, he was the, the cleverest of them all. And, and this is what he argues in that first book. He said, you're all fooling yourselves. And I know because I was one of you. And then he says, he, he, he basically argues that real knowledge is not all of these words. It's something much deeper than that. The words are necessary, but they are only a necessary. They are not a sufficient cause for the purpose of this. And then he will argue that the real purpose of this religion is to know God. It is about ma'rifa. It's about realization of God. But he says, but I'm not going to write about what he calls mukashafa, about the unveilings that will occur to people that take this religion seriously. What he says is, I'm going to write about mu'amala. I'm going to write about how you can achieve this state. And here's my book. And I divide it into four sections, quartos. The first section is going to be about the secrets of why we do all these things. He, what he says is, don't be content with simply doing wudu. There are Muslims now, when they go into the, the, the bathroom, they just, it's just this quick thing, and, and they see it as something they have to do before they do wudu. My own teacher, Marabtar Haj in the Sahara, I used to do wudu next to him. And he, on average, would take about 10 minutes to do wudu. It was really quite extraordinary to watch him do wudu. And I realized from his wudu that for him it was an act, act of ibadah. He was not simply doing a ritual. He was actually experiencing, because we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, when you rinse your mouth, the sins of your tongue flow out with the water. In the Shafi'i Madhab, the water of wudu is considered polluted. You can't actually use it. You have to dump it, water plants with it. But you can't drink it or use it because it, it's, it's polluted by the sins that have been washed away. And so Imam al-Ghazali is arguing that there are secrets to purification. And he says that when the Prophet said, At-Tahur shatur al-Iman, purification is half of this religion. He said, do not think that he is talking about this water ritual that we do. He is talking about purifying the heart. This is, this is what he's talking about. And this is only symbolic of that purification. And, and he talked about a man, the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you say about a man who lives beside a river and bathes in the river five times a day? Will you see any filth on him? And they said, certainly not, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, this is like the man who washes himself and then prays five times a day. This is what he is doing. In other words, what the outward washing is to the body, the inward reality is to the soul. And, and then he argues about prayer and what the purpose of prayer is. He says prayer is entering into the presence. And the reason that you say Allahu Akbar is you are pushing this world away from you and putting it behind you and you are entering into a state of presence with your Lord. And then he says you begin Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to the Lord of the worlds, the merciful, the compassionate. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Medici Yomi Deen, the sovereign of the day of judgment, or the master of the day of judgment. And then you speak directly. This is in Arabic called iltifat, where you move from a, a third person tense, what they call a khitab al-ghaib, to khitab al-hadir, where you move from speaking to somebody who's absent to speaking to somebody who's present. Iyaka na'abudu. 
To you alone we worship. To you alone we seek help. That this is, he says, this is what the Fatiha is. It's to enter into the presence of your Lord. It's not just to go through these motions, uh, this perfunctory act that you have to do five times a day. That this is about coming to intimate discourse with your Lord. And then you speak to your Prophet directly. As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. Peace be upon you. That's not salamu alayhi, as-salamu alayka. Because you understand that there is a spiritual presence. There is a spiritual presence. The Prophet ﷺ said, تُعْرَضَ عَلَيَّ عَمَالُكُمْ I see your actions. This is a sahih hadith in Al-Bazaar. I see your actions in the grave. فَإِذَا وَجَدْتُ خَيْرًا حَمِدْتُ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا وَجَدْتُ شَرًا أَسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَكُمْ If I see good, I praise God that these are my people, that I taught them to do good and they're doing good. And if I see you doing wrong, I ask forgiveness. He doesn't curse us. He doesn't say, why aren't they doing good? He asks forgiveness for us. So Imam al-Ghazali then talks about fasting and zakat. These, what are the meanings and hajj? The real meanings behind these, these things that we do and take for granted. And then he moves to the second, which is the second quarter of this ihya. And the architecture of the ihya is quite extraordinary if, if you examine it. He moves to the second quarter and he shows that you have daily things that you do. We were talking today about sacred monotony. This idea of doing these things that we do every day and they become our practice. Like the, the, the master archer who goes out every day and practices until it becomes effortless. It's no longer, he is no longer present. The beginner's mind is a wonderful mind, they say, because the beginner's mind is really the mind that has arrived. Because the beginner is always present. They, because they're so worried about getting it right. If you watch a beginner driver, I love when I drive by these schools, you know these driving schools? I love watching these people learning how to drive. They're usually about 16, and they're in there, and they're just, they're so present because they have the beginner's mind. You see, after a while, they, they, like everybody else, they're falling asleep at the wheel, right? They go from one place to another, and they don't know how they got there. But they've done that trip so many times because they're asleep at the wheel. The lights are on, but nobody's home. This is most people. We're somnambulant. We're sleepwalking through life. We're not present. We're not present in our meetings when we meet each other. We go through the motions. We shake the hands. We don't really hear the names. When I lived with the Bedouin in Mauritania, one of the things that really floored me about some of the Sadiqeen amongst them, one lady, and, and a very dear lady to me, she was the wife of my teacher and she died a few years ago, Maryam bint Bueba. And I wrote a, uh, a piece about her called Another Mother of the Believers. Maryam asked me when I first arrived there in 1984, she asked me if I had family, and I, and I said, yeah, and she said, what are their names? And I said, well, I've got, my, my mother's name is Elizabeth, and my father's name is David, and my brother's name, I have two brothers, one's name is John, and the other is Troy, and then I have four sisters. I have Kathleen, Patricia, Elizabeth, who's now called Nabila, and Mariah. And I didn't think anything of it. I left, after I left that period, I, there were 10 years before I went back. When I first saw Miriam, after 10 years, she said to me, Kifa David, Kifa Elizabeth, Kifa John, Kifa Troy, Kifa, Mariah, Patricia, and she named all of my family. <laughs> and it just, it just really, it was such a dagger to the heart because I realized <laughs> she wasn't just asking to chat. She wanted to know their names and she internalized their names. And 10 years later, she could recall 
names that she'd never heard in her life because they're not Arabic names and she only knew Arabic. And I, I was just so stunned, but she was a present human being. She did dhikr all the time. That was her life. She spent her life serving the students of that place. She knew every name of every student that ever came to that. And Gray, uh, Aisha met, met her and, and, and remembers her, you know. She, she was present. And, and this was from practice. This was from just the monotony of, of every day working on your presence with God. Because when you're present with God, you're present with the creation of God. You start noticing things like the wind in the trees. You start noticing the subtleties of everything that's around us. It becomes real. And, and this, is, this is what Imam al-Ghazali is arguing. That, and, and so he has the book of, he begins it with eating and drinking. We eat with no presence anymore. People used to take time before they ate and said grace, even in this country, people would stop before they ate and they would thank their Lord for the gifts which they were about to receive. This was common practice, being present with food. People used to be present when they cooked food. They cooked food with love. I had one teacher, one of my teachers, Omar Malahji, his wife would cook her food doing prayer on the Prophet the entire time with niya to shifa, that God would make that food a healing for the people that ate it and make the energy that they derive from it used for worshiping Allah. They would, they would only buy from grocers in Medina that they knew prayed five times in the prayer in the masjid. They would go out and pick their own animals and sacrifice them because they didn't want to buy meat from these butchers that they didn't know how they were treating the animals. This is a, a real family that I have visited over the years. It is a fact, and, and I guarantee you many people have experienced this. If, if you go and have eaten a full meal, and you go there and they serve you food in the house of Omar Malahji, you will not get indigestion by eating a second meal immediately after that at his house. And, and many people have testified to this because they will force you to eat. They will say, kul, kul, kul. They say, kul karijad wa ibka jimal. You know, eat like men and drink like camels. <laughs> that food was made with presence. We forget, people don't have energy anymore. How is your food being manufactured? How is it being grown? How is it being cooked? Because this is where energy comes from. It comes from, that's the sabab for the, ener the, the energy that we live on is caloric. It's heat derived from these means that God has given us. So he talks about being present when you eat, chewing your food, being grateful not putting another morsel in until you finish chewing the morsel that's in your mouth because he says this is from gluttony to don't eat quickly to eat with gratitude never mention death at the table he says death is not an appropriate because he said if your heart is alive and people mention death at, at eating you should lose your appetite and if you don't it's a sign that your heart is dead wendell berry the other night talked about people now reading about massacres or watching them on television while they're eating their dinners. And it has no effect on them. This is from deadened hearts. We're no longer feeling. And, and then he, he, he moves into, he ends this uh, chapter. He, 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 he begins the next section with the section on the wonders of the heart. And this is the section where he deals with what he calls the muhlikat, those things that are destructive to us. And the muhlikat, in his understanding, are the vices that will kill the heart. And he ends, he talks about pride and arrogance, and he distinguishes between vanity and arrogance. He says, vanity, all you need is a mirror, but arrogance always requires another person. 
So the vain person simply needs a mirror to admire himself, but the arrogant person needs another being to oppress. And, and he talks about the roots of these, and much of it is related to death, the fact that people have forgotten that they're, they're going to die. And then he ends this section with the book of delusion, or what we would call illusion, this, the internal state where we completely misread ourselves. We don't know who we are. The, the Arabic word, the, the, the Roman word for personality, persona, means mask. In Arabic, it's called shakhsiya, which comes from a word that means a shadow. So the personality is, is, is a shadow. It's an illusion. Who you think you are is not who you really are. Uh, who you are is, is related to your historical narrative, where you were born, where you grew up. You speak, if you speak here like a Kentuckian, uh, you have a certain way of speaking. But if you grew up in New York, you would be speaking like a New Yorker. These things have nothing to do with your personality. They're simply the, the, the circumstances you find yourself in. And, and he, he says that to get out of this delusional state is, is, is the beginning of the path, to want to get out of this state, to recognize that you're in it. And that's why the next book, which is the last 10 books, the book of salvation, the first chapter is about repentance, metanoia, changing your mind, turning back, realizing that the destination that you're on is one to your own death. And he ends this, he has fear and hope and trust in God, and he puts trust and tawheed in the same chapter, which is very interesting, because to him tawheed is not a theoretical construct, which it is to most Muslims, this idea God is one. No, to him, God is doing everything at every instant. That is Tawheed. And Ghazali is arguing that if you really understand this, you will have utter trust in God. You will put all your trust in God because it's all God. God is doing everything in every instant. And this is why if you're not content with your circumstances, he argues you're not content with God because it's God that put you into those circumstances, but what God is asking you to do is respond to them appropriately. That's the challenge. It's not the circumstances. The challenge is the power that God has given you in your will, your irada, to actually take your circumstances and respond appropriately. And there are only four circumstances and four requisite responses. You're in tribulation, and he says the response to that is patience. You're in a, a situation of blessing, and you have to respond to that with gratitude, and that will increase you. And if you don't do those things, what he says, if you're in a state of gratitude, and you respond by heedlessness, the blessings will be taken away from you, not as a punishment, but as a reminder to pull you back. One of the things he says, if God, he said there's only two types of people from a hadith, people in tribulation and people in good situations. He said, if you're in a good situation, God will send the people of tribulation to you. And if you reject them and close the door on them, he will make you the people of tribulation. He'll take away your blessings because your blessings are to serve the people in tribulation. These are the awakenings that he's trying to instill and inculcate. And this is why as you read this book, a transformation should occur. If it doesn't, you haven't read the book. But the book is not to be read once. In the uh, Hadrami tradition, the 40 books were read one book a day for the rest of your life. And this is what the Hadarima did. Every 40 days they would do a khatam of the Ihya and start over again. And I was fortunate to be in one of those gatherings with Sheikh Ali Balfagi, a Hadrami scholar, and he literally could finish the sentences by rote of the Ihya because he knew it so well. And when we would read it on Thursday nights, we would go to his house and we would read it and he would literally correct all, he was blind, he couldn't see. And he would correct the, with the readers when they would read, if they made a mistake, he would correct them. It was really quite an extraordinary experience for me to see somebody who had completely internalized this. All the people that I have met that have been part of this tradition are really some of the most extraordinary human beings. 
that I've ever met. My own teacher, Muhammad Hajj, spent several, a, a, a large period of his life reading nothing but the Ihya in a graveyard outside of, of the Bedouin encampment where he was from. And the Prophet Sallallahu visit the graves. And this is why Imam al-Ghazali ends his great book, the Ihya, with the Book of Death. Because Imam al-Ghazali argues, this door is right in front of you. You are knocking on this door right now. You don't know when it's going to be open, but you come into this world and you are knocking on the door of death. And that door is a door that opens to infinity. And he's saying you are here for this finite period of time. And it's, it's such a great gift to be alive, to be a human being. It's a great gift to be a rock as opposed to not existing at all. It's a greater gift to be a flower. It's a greater gift to be a tree. And it's a greater gift to be an eagle. But what a gift to be a human being, to be a conscious human being, created on the doors of eternity, literally created on the doors of eternity. And this is what he is constantly reminding us. And he's saying, you're on this journey and you're either conscious of it or you're not. Once you become conscious of it, you have to become an active wayfarer, not sleeping on the bus, but driving the bus, making sure that it didn't take a detour down the wrong road. Because all the roads lead to death, but only one of them leads to a good death. And, and that's the road of ihsan, of being a beautifier, being somebody that makes the world a better place than you found it. That when you leave the world, the world was better for having you in it. And this is the ultimate criterion of a human being, whether they lived a worthwhile life or whether they squandered their life in frivolity, vacuity, and stupidity. And he uses the word stupid many, many times. Many times. He's, he's, he doesn't shy away from that word because all of us know that we have elements of stupidity in our lives. Nobody's free of this. But to not squander, to not, to not squander this life is the essence of intelligence. Whether you're a street sweeper or a professor, a doctor, a judge, a lawyer, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it with purpose, intentionality, purity of end and means, then you're doing the right thing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I would argue that we're in one of the greatest crises that we've ever been in as a community, the Muslims. And I'll conclude just by saying a few words about this and why Imam al-Ghazadi is so relevant for us today. Imam al-Ghazadi hated sectarianism because he felt that the sectarian mind was a provincial mind. It was a mind that was incapable of seeing universals, that it was trapped in the, in the realm of particulars. And he also recognized the concept of the wayfarer. And my, my father, who taught philosophy and humanities at the university level, spent a good deal of time with Aquinas and a lot of, a lot of time, with, more time with Plato, probably. But he knows the Western canon very well. He spent his life reading and rereading it. He saw a film about Imam al-Ghazali, and he asked me, is this man in translation? I said, yes. He said, could you get me the book? So I gave him several books of Imam al-Ghazali, including The Alchemy of Happiness, the two-volume version. And he devoured those books. And when he finished, he told me two things. He said, I know my tradition reasonably well. And he said, and I can honestly say to you, I don't think the West has ever produced a Ghazali. And, this, and coming from him, for me, that was quite a statement. The second thing he said, if you spend the rest of your life just reading this man, it won't be a life wasted, an intellectual waste of a life. But the purpose that al-Ghazali makes very clear is it's not about reading me. It's about taking what I've written and writing your own story with your life. 
being these meanings, embodying these meanings. And that's why he's hujjat al-Islam. He is the proof of Islam. And in, in this age that we're living in, when men of religion and women of religion are so few throughout the Muslim world, I, I can honestly attest to the fact that I, I've met many very devout Muslims, but it's rare that I've met these types of people that are transformative by being in their presence. That the work that they've done and put into themselves, and I've met women and men of this caliber and stature in the Muslim world, and, and they have always had the same effect on me. And, and these are the people that Imam Ghazali is calling us to be because we need more people like this. The imbalance on this planet is from the lack of people of stillness, of people of presence. The Quran says that when the Hamiyat al Jahiliya, this zealousness and fanaticism of the Jahili people, uh, riled them up, Allah says that He sent down His sakina, His tranquility on the believers, on the Prophet and on the believers, that the response to fanaticism and zealotry is sakina. It's not more fanaticism and more zealotry. But Sakina is not something, it's something that God will descend upon hearts that are open to it. If the hearts aren't open to it, they won't receive it. They'll miss it in their own agitation. And so Imam al-Ghazali is really to me an antidote to so much of what we're seeing out there, all this madness. I think they would be shocked at, at the type of, of, of Islam and the lack of community. We've got a lot of good Muslims, everybody in this room, you're, you're good people. But our community, our ummah, when, when we saw what was done to Gaddafi when he was captured, that, that brought shame on our community as a community. It brought shame. And if it didn't bring shame on you, then shame on you. Because our Prophet ﷺ, when he came into Mecca, he came in with his head bowed. When he had the power to crush the people that had crushed his people for 13, for 20, 20 years. When he had them in his power. And they said, what are you going to do with us? And he said, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. He said what Joseph said. There's no blame today. This is not a day of blame. Hind, who had bitten into the liver of his own uncle, his beloved uncle, he sat with her and spoke with her. And it was painful. When he met Wahshi, he asked him to tell the story of his killing his uncle. And when he got to the point where he pierced him, he said, Kuf anka hasbuka, it's enough. And tears were flowing down his eyes. And this was the necessary confessional that they did in South Africa where they made these criminals come before the South Africans and tell them their crimes. Speak their crimes because this is how we purge these things from ourselves by admitting these things. It's not about public humiliation. It's about people taking responsibility for their actions and, and a great opportunity was squandered. But th this is the crisis that we're in and we have an immense amount of work. I wanna thank uh, a few people in here uh, Dr. Paracha for coming. Uh, he's a dear friend and, and really one of, the, one of the pillars of our national community. I also, uh, Gray Henry, Aisha Gray Henry is, is a, a friend of now many years and I'll just briefly say the first time I met her was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was a, a very young uh, student of Arabic and, and I didn't have enough money to buy it but I just wanted to see Lane's legendary two volume masterful Dictionary of the Arabic language. And so I, I went to her shop in Cambridge, the Islamic Text Society, and she actually had the two volumes on the desk. And, and I told her, I just want to look at this book. I, I'd love to buy it, but I can't afford it. And she said, how much money do you have? And, and I looked in my pocket and I had 10 quid. And so she said, just give me 10 pounds. I gave her 10 pounds, I think it was about 55 pounds at the time. And she gave me this two volume, which I still have in my library. This was 
over 20 years ago. And we've been friends. That's a good way of gaining a friend quickly, being generous. So she's been a dear friend. She's from a beautiful family, Kentuckian family, from the founders of Louisville. And, and I want to also acknowledge another great Kentuckian family, the, the Binghams, Eleanor Binghams here uh, tonight. These, these are, the, these are the, really the, the, the families that built this city, that, that, that put their money and their lives and their civic service into this city. And those of you who have migrated to this city from other places, acknowledging these are the ayan, they're what the, the Arabs call the mela. And, and it's important to acknowledge these people and, and, and seek their counsel and, and, uh, and work with them to better this community. And also, uh, I would have much rather had uh, the great Coleman Barks come up and recite some Rumi for us. But one of the great poets of America uh, came tonight, Dr. Coleman Barks. And, and uh, I'll just say one thing. Uh, Rumi, like Ghazali, is what I call a trans-historical figure because they speak across centuries. Some people speak to their time and their place, but these people speak to every time and every place, not on, on every detail. Sometimes they're men or women of their time, but on these great issues, they speak across centuries. And that's why when we read them, they affect our hearts. And uh, Coleman really single-handedly has opened up to a generation of Americans the great wisdom teachings of, of our tradition, of which Rumi is only a voice. He's one of the greatest voices because he was gifted in that. But he is part of a tradition, and we forget that. Rumi, in that way, is not saying anything from Jalaluddin. What he is reiterating is these eternal truths that were given to our Prophet ﷺ, and that's why he, in the end, is a student of our Prophet Muhammad. Imam al-Ghazali is a student of our Prophet Muhammad. I want to thank the community for coming out in support of Zaytuna. Uh, I really hope that in, in the coming years you see the fruit of this. We have immense potential. May Allah give us tawfiq. And uh, also Peter from The Courier is here. He wrote a very nice article the last time. I'm not going to hold you to that. This time you can write whatever you want. So it's a free country and a free press. Last I heard. Anyway, so um, God bless all of you. Uh, Barakallah fikum. I really thank you. I thank Dr. Ihsan Bugbi, who's a great uh, servant of this community and rightly honored tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate all of you, increase all of you. Uh, bring you closer to God, you know, bring you closer to Allah. Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. It actually says carotid artery, but jugular vein sounds nicer in English, so it's usually translated as jugular vein. But the carotid artery is the artery of consciousness, because all you have to do, every doctor knows, you want to knock somebody out, just put your thumb on his carotid artery and he's gone. And God is closer to us than our own consciousness. So may Allah make us conscious servants of the one true, living, eternal Lord of all the worlds. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.